Welcome to the Lifestyle Builders Podcast, show 36. In our last episode, we talked about implementing systems and processes. In today's episode, we've got another one from our Q&A series. Welcome to the Lifestyle Builders Podcast, where we bring you real-life strategies on starting and growing a business and finding financial freedom without sacrificing the life you have with your loved ones. We are your hosts, Tom and Ariana Sylvester, and we are married, we're parents, and we're serial entrepreneurs. This podcast is for those who want more out of life. We'll show you how to take the vision you have and create the business that will help you achieve it. Join us as we share practical steps, real life stories, and help you become a lifestyle builder. All right, you guys, welcome back. We are back today with a Q&A episode. Q&A with TNA. Oh, wow. So we've got three questions from three business owners, and we're going to dive in and talk through those questions and some possible solutions for them. Yep. All right. So I'll start off with the introduction. We have for question, our first question comes from Kathy Topping. Kathy is from Your Web Toolkit, and she helps online business owners build, market, and monetize their websites. Her question is, I try to follow a 90-day goal planning regime in my business, but often find that I get distracted and lose focus partway through. Do you have any tips on really nailing down a 90-day goal plan and how to commit and follow through on these goals? So, this is a whopper of a question. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and the good thing, um, just starting off, is that you are following a 90-day goal planning process. Yes. That's what we use. That's what we preach. And, you know, it's really effective because even kind of going to that point, a lot of people just think about doing once a year planning. Mm -hmm. And the problem is it's too big. It's easy to fall off. Um, generally, 90 days is a good time frame to avoid this type of issue. Yep. Um, but the, the first question that I would ask, and clearly we don't have Kathy here, <laughs> so I'll ask and then make some assumptions. We'll go from there, is why do you find yourself getting distracted and losing focus? Mm -hmm. You know, because anytime we're looking for a solution, we first have to really understand the problem. I am going to go out on a limb and guess that along with the majority of other entrepreneurs out there, you are probably following along with your 90 day goal plan and getting distracted by that a little bit of that like shiny object syndrome like somebody comes out with a new tactic or a new strategy uh a new um a new trend pops up in the market and it is a little easy to get distracted and think like oh maybe i should switch to jump over to that because that looks like it's working and what I'm doing right now doesn't seem like it's working or, or something along those lines. So then you get distracted, you jump over there, but then when you come back to your 90 day goal plan, you find that you're now out of alignment with that plan and nothing that you've tried to get from results is actually happening. Yeah. And there's a couple other pieces too. So we'll just throw out all the potentials and hopefully one or more of these hits your need, Kathy. <laughs> um, the other thing too is 90 days is just one of the meetings mm -hmm. that we recommend. And basically your planning and execution cadence. Um, we already mentioned the first one, which is annual. Then 90 days is the key because that gives you an opportunity to break your one year goals down into 90 day chunks. And then every 90 days or every three months, you're checking in. Yep. How am I doing? What do I need to adjust? And then you're planning the next 90 days. What a lot of people miss is that there's actually meetings within those 90 days as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we like to have a monthly meeting, which is really uh, you'll see an extension of this weekly meeting we'll talk about. But it also adds in a little bit of the budgeting perspective so that you're looking at your financials. And if you're checking in once a month on your 90-day goals, then what that gives you is the opportunity to do a little bit of reflection and say, okay, one month has passed out of three. You know, Are there adjustments or how are things going? What Am else I are progressing you do? towards my goal or yep. has everything just kind of stopped? Yep. I mean, the other one, which is really the key, is the weekly meeting. And when you set your 90 day goals, an important thing to do is basically say, how am I measuring this? Yeah. Right. So how do I know at the end of 90 days that I've achieved this? And then what a lot of people also miss. So that's we're going to get a little technical here. <laughs> so that's called your lagging indicator or your lagging metric, because it tells you after the fact if you've achieved something. But it doesn't tell you along the way 
if you're likely to achieve it. Yep. So for example, if you step on the scale at the end of the week, it's going to tell you if you met your weight loss goal or not, but you can't change that. So the other thing you want to put in place for every goal is something called a leading indicator. And that's basically something that's going to tell you if you're likely to achieve your goal. So in the example of weight loss, a leading indicator or um, something you might be looking at is how many calories are you taking in? Mm -hmm. You know, because it really comes down to math to say, okay, um, on average, I need 2000 calories. Uh, to lose a pound of fat, it's 3,500 calories. So if I reduce and you know, have 300 less calories a day, I know I'll lose a pound a week or whatever the math comes out to. But what that does is it allows you to then say, okay, what I'm going to track each day is the number of calories that I've taken in and then also maybe burned f through working out. Yep. And what that then allows you to do is identify the key tasks that you have to do to reach that goal, which is obviously eating the right stuff and then potentially working out. So by doing this, you one get very clear on the key activities you should be doing but then every week you can check in and say okay am i doing the right activities and then how am i progressing towards that goal and then you can make adjustments mm -hmm. so by by doing that activity what that's going to allow you to do is to let you check in along the way so it's not like it's just 90 days and that's it but you're getting those checkpoints along the way which i find checking in once a week on those things um, it's not too frequent, but it's frequent enough to then make adjustments and make sure we're on the right path. Yeah. And then there's another aspect to this that could potentially be causing you this issue of getting distracted halfway through your plan. And that is that a lot of us find the accountability piece really, really difficult to do by ourselves. Um, I am a great example of this. I am horrible at keeping myself accountable to things, especially like going to the gym, I'm just like, oh, well, my goal was to go twice and I went once. So, you know, that's good enough because I don't really feel like going today. What I've done because I know that is I put it in my calendar for one thing, because then it's on the calendar like, oh, I'm supposed to go to the gym today. Then I also have a partner in life who is really good at helping me kind of get motivated to stick with my goals and say, well, you said you wanted to go twice a week. If you don't go today, that means you've got to go tomorrow. Otherwise, you're not going to hit your goal. So what I would ask is, is it on your end that you're having a tough time keeping yourself accountable to this 90 day goal plan that you've set? Because a lot of times it is tough to like, we talk about having meetings all the time. Well, there's two of us. So having meetings is a little bit easy for us. We have the advantage of having another person to talk to, another person to keep us accountable. If you're on your own and you don't have a partner in the business or you don't have a team member in your business that you can kind of have these quote unquote meetings with, to have a meeting on your own can be something that's very difficult to keep yourself accountable to. It's very easy to let it go and be like, well, I didn't do my weekly check-in with myself this week, but that's okay. I'll do it next week. And then next week you don't have it again. And then you haven't had one in a month. And then you miss your one for your 90 day goals. And it just kind of snowballs. So if the accountability piece is what's throwing you off, what's making it really difficult for you to stick with the plan, I would say test out some different methods of trying to keep yourself accountable. Easiest one, is to put those those meetings or those check-ins right on your calendar. Another is if you're part of any kind of like group programs or memberships or anything like that, you can post up in the group and say, guys, this is what I want to keep myself accountable to. Can someone help me and check in on me, make sure I'm doing that? Well, and that was actually something that we built into Lifestyle Builders mm -hmm. um, because everyone was struggling. When we talked to people, they're all struggling with that accountability piece. Yep. Um, so, and I know there's a couple other programs that do that too, where it's like the part of joining the program is not necessarily because you need all of the training or all help all the time. Part of it is that accountability piece, having a group of people that are there to support you, but also to keep you honest with the goals that you've set and to call you out when you're drifting away from, from the plan. Yeah. And I mean, it, like some people, it's just getting an accountability partner, another entrepreneur to help each other. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's joining a membership or a group like that. Or sometimes it's a mastermind where it's yep. a little bit higher level. Sometimes it might be you need to hire a coach that you meet with once every 90 days and they are going to keep you accountable to the goals that you have. It's, it's all dependent on your level of need. Um, but I would say anything that we just mentioned, kind of like think through some of that stuff and figure out 
Which of those reasons is why you think you can't? Well, I was going to say, let me throw out one more. Oh, he's got so, another. Um, you were talking about the shiny objects. Mm -hmm. So it could either be shiny objects or you could be coming up with new ideas or new approaches. So what's really important is to basically whenever a new idea or a new potential opportunity comes up, basically saying, okay, does this contribute to the goals that I laid out? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is no, then we're likely Shelf going to shelve it we're going to have a place to put those ideas and then at our next 90 day cycle we'll put we'll review them and say should one of these make it on there mm -hmm. the other thing is if it doesn't align with the goal the next question i would ask is you know is, is this a higher it? priority than maybe something i set mm -hmm. right because when you plan your 90 days you only know what you know at that time something might change a week in that now forces you to shift those 90 day goals and do something else mm -hmm. so if you're asking those two questions and having a way to keep track of those ideas so you don't lose them but they don't distract you that will help a lot yeah so kathy when you listen into this episode let us know if we covered uh, your your question thoroughly and if not you can uh, check in with us and we'll do a follow-up with you yep sweet all right question number two comes from hannah from hannah beer coaching she is a soulful success coach and family constellation therapist and hannah would like to know i'm very introverted and marketing is my biggest challenge when someone finds my work they usually opt into my newsletter and my conversion is pretty good the list building aspect of my business is a challenge though because sometimes i get overwhelmed and hesitant to pitch my story when the online space feels so hyped up and intense do you know of any list building strategies that work well for intuitive introverted people Another good question. So <laughs> He's I'm actually, I was gonna say, well, I'm actually gonna take a piece from what she said uh, about the online face being so hyped up and intense. Um, it it is in a lot of cases. The benefit of this though is that when you're authentic in who you are in your messaging, um, one, it's refreshing for a lot of people, and two, you're gonna attract the right types of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, like one thing with with this podcast we made a decision that we weren't going to edit it. So like what you guys see is what you get. Um, and here. And here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, and we've had a lot of people reach out to us and just appreciate us screwing up in the middle of the podcast and leaving it in there. <laughs> or the cat. <laughs> yeah, or the cat like running through the living room with a PlayStation wrapped around it, what, whatever it is. Um, so one of the first things that I would say is, you know, and, and people say this, but sometimes you got to hear it multiple times really be yourself. Um, you know, if anyone's watching the video cast of this, we literally have part of our manifesto up on the wall mm -hmm. and it's something that we read all the time. And when we define this, it helped us become clearer on who we wanted to track, who we worked for with, um, what we stood for. Mm -hmm. And then I think that just helped everything else become easier to do because it's on point with who we are in our brand. Well, and w what comes across to me is it is very loud in this space. There are a lot of people doing so many different things and there's businesses for pretty much anything that you can think of in this industry. Um, and list building often comes up as, as this thing that everyone is always elusively chasing, like building the list. What I want to point out is you said when people find your work, you normally have a pretty good conversion rate. So obviously your message is getting across and people are loving what you're doing. What I would say for you is to now on your end, figure out where those people are coming from and find specific places that they are and get in front of them. So if you can track like how someone finds your website or where they're coming from with like Google analytics to see like, are they searching and finding me? What are the keywords they're searching and finding me for? Um, also, if they're coming from different places and landing on your site, how are they getting to you? Because if you can identify where those people are coming from and what else they're listening to, reading, uh, searching on the internet, what you can do is then find places where you're comfortable being yourself, like finding podcasts to be a guest on. There are a million podcasts out there and there are people that are doing interviews that are always looking for good guests to interview. So if you can identify some of the stuff that people are finding you for and go and say, okay, there's five podcasts out there that I think my audience is listening to. Go and pitch yourself 
to be a guest on those podcasts. And when you're when you're thinking about like you, you said, I get overwhelmed and hesitant to pitch my story. When you go to pitch those podcasts, don't think about it as you pitching your story. Think about it as how can you bring value to the listeners of that podcast? Because at the end of the day, that's what the host is worried about. They want to bring people on that their audience connects to, relates with, and you know, people that can help their audience in some way that they're feeling pain or a struggle. And for you, it feels less like you're pitching yourself when you're going into it with the end result being helping people. So what you're doing is just finding more ways to get in front of those people who find your work and love it. So you can do that with podcasts. You can do that with blog, like guest blogging. If you find other um, other places that take guest blog submissions, you can be on write a blog for those on some of the biggest pain points people are feeling. Um, you can look to get some PR if you find other places and maybe somebody does a story on you and you can kind of share some of your stuff there. Um, be a guest on other people's Facebook lives if they do lives for their groups and you can come in and talk to them. I know it's tough when you, a lot of people talk about being introverted and it's very tough to kind of like go out and be in front of people. But the, the true thing is you're going to have to get used to it being a business owner. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be completely 100% comfortable with it all the time, but you can make the choice to get slightly uncomfortable and do some of those things because you know that the end result is you helping more people and more people coming back to find you. Yeah, a um, couple great points I just want to highlight that you mentioned. Um, the first one was really understanding where people are coming from. And a big thing that we work with people on is helping them understand their customer journey. Mm -hmm. And once you understand, like, and you can even take all your existing people and kind of reverse engineer, how did they find me? When did they first find me? When did they opt in? You'll start to really paint a picture of that common path, that common journey that people go through before they become a customer. Mm -hmm. And then you can do more of that. Yeah. Because sometimes you might be, on a guest podcast or guest blog post, and you don't know which ones are effective. But like you said, if you're tracking some of that with Google Analytics or other tools, um, that's going to be really powerful. Um, the other thing is introvertedness, where a lot of people don't realize a, a lot of it is just how you process things. Mm -hmm. um, all of us, to some degree, are probably not comfortable with like public speaking, for example, or something else. But as you said, it's important that we say, what are some of the key things we've got to do to build our business? And then... Uh, it's always a little bit uncomfortable. Yep. Um, so those are two great points. It's knowing which uncomfortable situations to put yourself in too. I Absolutely. Think. You know, like some of us may be more comfortable on a podcast than going on live TV yep. or a Facebook live. So it's, it's really looking at like, what are my options? What are the things that are just slightly uncomfortable enough that I think I can still do it, but it's not going to throw me for a huge loop. Yeah. The other thing I want to say too, um, before we really talk about list building, to me, one of the, the common misconceptions or things that's pushed online, especially, is that you got to build your list. You got to build your list. Um, I, I don't know what level your business is at, but you're uh, a coach and a therapist. So I'm imagining that the price points on your products are probably pretty good. Mm -hmm. So you don't need a million customers to probably achieve your goals. One of the things that I think is overlooked is quality over quantity. Correct. So there's a lot of people that focus on just, well, how many people do you have on your email list? If you have 50,000 people on your email list and nobody's buying, it doesn't matter. That was all wasted effort. Not wasted, but it's it's not converting. Yep. What you're oftentimes much better at is saying, okay, I need 10 clients. What's my most direct path to find those 10 clients? Um, and oftentimes it might be a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Mm -hmm. It might be going to an event or somewhere, like you said, where they gather and then talking to them there and converting them that way. Yep. So if you're like, if you're not doing that, that might be a thing to look at. And it's not to say don't build your email list. I mean, you know, we've been building ours, um, but we also spend a lot of time doing one on one conversations because especially like, you know, with coaching and stuff like that, that's a lot of where we get people. Yep. The list building supports that. It kind of lets people be comfortable with us. Um, but I mean, a lot of our, our sales come from especially our higher end people. stuff is actually talking to people. Yep. Um, so don't discount that and look at that as an opportunity to say, how many clients do I need? And then what's the most direct path? And then as you're doing that, a byproduct can be 
the email list and more value and whatever else. Yep. All right. Awesome. I think we are ready to jump to question number three. And this question comes from Katie Schweitzer. She is a parent advocate and she wants to reach parents who spank, yell, and stress and help them understand why it doesn't work uh, because then they often end up doing it more and what strategies do. Katie says, I want to hear about how you reach people through Facebook that don't necessarily agree with you, but you still want to reach them. Facebook likes to hand me people who already agree, so it's hard to find those people and have a bigger impact. All right, so a couple initial thoughts here, and we can dive in deeper. Mm -hmm. Um, One, I wouldn't necessarily just limit myself to Facebook. That's one channel, but it may or may not be the best one, depending on what you're looking for. Um, The second thing I would say, and this is probably a little bit of a larger topic, trying to reach out to people that have an opposing view and convert them to your view is usually pretty challenging. Mm -hmm. Um, So offhand, one of the things I might do in that space is just rethink um, the end result I'm looking for and the strategy that I go about for that. Because, you know, like whether it's something like, like, I would imagine, I mean, I'm a parent, we don't spank, you know. Do do um, some yelling. We we do yell (laughs) on occasion. Um, But, you know, that is something that I think is is very emotional. And we all kind of have our own view on it based on how we were raised and whatever else. Um, That I see probably similarly ingrained to what political party you're a part of, what religion you're a part of, what sports team you like. Yeah, parents, parents and their parenting styles. And then just the judgmental space of everyone wants to tell you how you're parenting wrong yep. could be very difficult to navigate, I think. Because I would imagine, like, if someone came to me, and I'm not saying that you're doing this, but if someone came to me and basically told me I was parenting wrong and this is the right way to do it, I would think most people would probably dismiss that or it would push them into their position even more. Yeah. I think what you want to do is navigate the middle ground very strategically. First of all, I think a lot of what you're going to end up doing is educating. Yep, absolutely. So you have to learn to educate in a positive way as opposed to, you know, talking about spanking, yelling, stressing, being wrong. More so you want to look at what are these other strategies and how do they benefit you? How can they transform your relationship with your kids? How can they transform your emotional stress that you have as a parent trying to deal with all these issues? So I would say first you're going to want to look at how you're wording things and how like what are the what are the keywords that people are using when they go to look up this stuff? Do people search about how can I stop yelling so much? How can I discipline my kids without having the stress aspects to it. Like I would really dive into the research of what are parents that are commonly doing these things feeling, where are they getting this information from? Like Tom said, a lot of this stuff is kind of built into how we were raised ourselves and what cultural parts of the world we're in. A lot of that stuff kind of has the impact on how people are raising their kids today. So before you even know where to find these people, you really got to get into their heads and figure out what they're following, what books are they reading, what podcasts are they listening to, like where are these parents hanging out so that you can see how they're thinking and how they're feeling before you even try to kind of start that re-education into those different methods. Yeah, well, and so a couple thoughts on here. Um, Parents are probably at different points of the spectrum. It sounds like you're trying to target people that are at the very farthest end. And they're the ones that are going to have the longest journey to going from where they're at to coming to really your perspective Mm -hmm. and there. What I would maybe look is see if you can have groupings of people. So who are the people that are just outside of? Like on the fence. Yeah, they're on the fence because... One, those people are going to be closer to your end solution anyways. Yep. They're going to be easier to convince. And if you kind of map the process from where they are to where you want them to be, now as you go to like the next ring of the people that are a little further away, all you got to do is close the gap between that and then the next step, and then you can move them down there. Mm-hmm. Um, The other thing I would say, so basically what you're trying to do here is you're trying to change behavior. And 
I've, I've spent years in organizations, working with leaders, working with teams, trying to do this. It's challenging. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of good books and there's a process that I'm going to recommend you take a look at. It's called ADCAR. And basically, this is a change management process that basically says, okay, when people go through a change, they're going to go through these five phases. First, they need to be aware. So they need to be aware of why am I doing this? What's in it for me? Um, and, and even that it exists. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing, which I think is where you're going to face some of the challenges, they have to have a desire to do it. Correct. Right? What's in it for them or what's in it for their You've kids? You've got to be able to show the benefits and the transformational Correct. piece. Correct. Because why, why does somebody yell or spank or whatever? Oh. They're getting some result out of it. It's helping. It. My, my kids are doing something wrong. I spank them. In my mind, they learn. Right. That's what's going on or something like that in the head of the people you're trying to get involved with. So they see that as solving a problem. Mm -hmm. You've got to then understand and give them a desire. And, and this is even going into like how you change habits um, to still get the same end result, but through a different method and show them why it's a benefit to them and their kids. Mm -hmm. I think you'd also you have to be this is a tough one because the targeting can be so broad because you're targeting parents, millions of them out there. You're targeting parents who spank, yell, stress. I'm guessing that that's the majority of us um, in some way, shape, or form. Maybe they don't do all of those things, but they do one of them. So your audience base is huge with that. So as Tom said, you're gonna want to one, kind of fill those segments in with like where on the spectrum are people. Who are the people in there that want to change, that want to have a different relationship with their kids and be less stressed at home? The other thing I want you to think about too is what are the age groups of the parents that you're targeting? Because, I mean, we're, we're 34. There are parents that are older than us. They're probably a little bit more set in their ways. There are parents that are younger than us. And then you've got people that are just jumping into the parent pool. Maybe they're trying to get pregnant. They're currently pregnant. They're reading all the books. They're getting yeah. all the knowledge. Those are your people that are more likely to be open to this kind of education than the people who are already parenting and would have to do a huge change in their own behavior and shift their kids' behaviors. So I think if you can kind of dive into niching into who you're targeting specifically, another thing is mm. like, what age group are you targeting? Millennials, as so many of us are called these days, I don't know what the age range actually is, <laughs> But millennials are more likely to be open to different styles of parenting than some of the older generations. So obviously, if you can do the work and do the research behind where are these people, who are the people that are open to different styles, and really dig in there, if you can nail that, then you can start working on the outskirts, those people that are just outside of those groups. Maybe they're not as open to it, but if they see success stories of parents that are using these methods and there's videos going viral on Facebook of like, you know, a case study of parents who changed how they were parenting, like all of that stuff, parents eat it up. Yep. But it's hard to target us on something like Facebook because taking myself, for example, I don't follow parenting pages. I don't have like a, a, somebody that I listen to for parenting psychology, like stuff like that. I just, our, our kids are good kids. We have a method that works. So I don't feel like I need to do any of that. Whereas, you know, some people may or may not have different interests on Facebook that you could target, well, but you want to be able to know where your people are. Well, but part of that though, so even though you may not, the general demographic probably does, yeah. right? There's indicators of like, maybe you don't specifically do that, but like one of the things now we're diving into details with Facebook is like, you can create lookalike audiences. True. So you could find all the parents that like a certain page or whatever that is, and then create a lookalike audience of somebody else that also looks like that, but maybe they don't like that page. Yeah. So depending on how advanced you are with Facebook, there's a lot of stuff you can do. Um, but I, I want to bring back the point you said, I remember when, before we became parents, you don't know what you don't know. Correct. And you haven't solidified opinions on a lot of things yet. Like one thing that stands out was like breastfeeding. Yep. And I remember we went to like the two hour seminar beforehand and I don't, I don't think we were sure on one way or the other. No, we were we just kind of open to figuring out. We might have been leaning out, one way. Yeah, we were open to figuring out what we wanted to do. So at that point, to your point, we were a lot more open. 
after we had had one child and picked away and went, which for us was breastfeeding, we were more solidified because we had the experience. Yep. So to me, as you were saying that, targeting people before they become parents, I think is when they're most impressionable and less likely to have a Or with very opinion. young, like maybe parents with infants because they haven't had because to do they haven't the discipline stuff yet. Yep. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's spot on. I just want to finish the rest of that ad car model quick. So we had awareness and desire. Where you come in is then giving them the knowledge, helping them understand that. And then the last two sections are the ability to do it and then reinforcement to stick with it. Mm -hmm. So go and look up that model. It's called ad car. But if you think about that, what you're then going to be looking for is what does that look like for you and the people you're targeting? And what specific things do you have to do to get them from each phase to the next phase? And it, it will take some time, you know, to figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I love your recommendations on really segmenting that down and look at who those people are. Well, and are. I think, as you said, like Facebook may not be the way to go to figure some of this stuff out. You may have to go out into the sea of the internet and find those middle ground places where people are getting that information where you can see like what are they feeling what are they thinking what are kind of some of those emotions they're going through yeah and, and like you said even just kind of building off of that so if you end up targeting the people that are becoming first-time parents or before you can then find blogs or find the places where they're looking for that information and guest blogging or guest podcasting or any of those mm -hmm. things um, could be very effective. Yep. Um, or even like the, the parenting classes that the hospitals offer, you yeah. know, having information like that readily oh, yeah. available for people, for them to send even, home Even donating, people. I was going to say donating that information and having it in those bags that they give you. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing too, I, I think just at least my last point until I come up with like five more. <laughs> at least I, you're honest. I think this is a, a touchy subject and you've got, you clearly have a strong position on it. I think it's just important that you're careful at how you message this, not to make fee people feel bad or ashamed, yeah. especially as you get into the people that have done it. Um, I mean, it'd be like, you know, someone that's been drinking alcohol, they're drunk and now they're going into AA, right? There's a certain process they go through to, to understand and to feel connected with those people. Um, it's not like judgmental or anything. Yep. So I'm not saying that you do this, but that would be just be something that I would make sure that you avoid. Even if you don't think you're doing it, some of your messaging or stuff might come off that way and actually go against the mission that you're set out to do. Yeah, and realize it is going to be harder to kind of take that stance because as you said, like Facebook already knows the stance that you have. So it's showing you the people that agree with you in the same sense. You're going to find that as you start to talk about some of this stuff, there are going to be people who just shut it out because they aren't ready to hear it. So you just have to get comfortable with the fact that like you're going to be in a certain spot and there's going to be some people around you that support you and are completely behind what you're saying. Then there's going to be some people that are like, huh, okay, that sounds like something that I could maybe jump on board with. And then as you keep getting further and further away, there's going to be people within all of those segments until you get to people on the complete opposing end. And as Tom said, with your messaging, with some of the stuff that you're doing, you do want to educate people. You want to advocate for this stuff. So just being aware and obviously like the whole judgment zone of parenting is very, very very, very tough. Like so many of us just have the blinders on because we're so tired of being judged by other people who don't agree with what we're doing. So yeah, I would just see how you can be clever and how you can kind of get around some of those judgmental waves that people are making so that you can educate people and kind of get them on the fence before you're, you know, kind of like shutting the doors. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Um, so I said it was the final point, but I got one You more. totally are just going to keep going. I, I warned you. Um, the final thing I would say is sometimes leaving the decision open mm. and letting people decide is very powerful. So you can lay out pros and cons of each approach and then basically leave it up to people and they can kind of select their own path. And guess what? The people that select the path to spank you're probably not going to change them without a lot more going on. Mm -hmm. But 
like I, I mean, think about like your kids, right? If you tell your kids to do something, they're actually going usually to usually going argue the other way. <laughs> but if you leave it up to them and you give them the knowledge and you let them make the decision, more often they'll end up making the decision that's right. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that's important too as you're looking to like change people's behaviors, um, understanding more of the psychology of how we make decisions. Um, there's also actually, uh, I know we don't have a Tom's bookshelf for this one. Um, there's a there's one. a there's a book out there called um, uh, I think it's Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely. Um, very interesting book. He basically ran a bunch of experiments and could predict how people would react based on how irrational we are. Um, it was very intriguing. And I think there's probably a lot of elements of psychology that you can use to your advantage mm. as you go out to do these things. Yeah. All right. You done now? You better end the done show. Done with the points? Or okay. We're keep going. <laughs> All right. So to end the show, before Tom comes up with five million more points to talk about, <laughs> Thank you to our three submissions for today's Q&A episode from Kathy, Hannah, and Katie. Uh, if you are listening and you'd like to submit your own question, head over to tomandariana.com slash question. And of course, the show notes from today, if you want to find any of our submissions and you know, check out their websites, we will put all of those links on the show notes page at tomandariana.com slash 36. Sweet. Sweet. All right. It's been another great episode with Tom and Ariana, your hosts and lifestyle builders. And as always, it's your life, your business, your way. We'll see you next time. Bye. Are you frustrated by a lack of momentum in your business? Do you want real-time guidance and support from seasoned entrepreneurs who really care about your results? If you're nodding your head or awkwardly shouting yes in public somewhere, then we invite you to join Lifestyle Builders, a mentorship program designed to meet you where you are and give you strategic and custom guidance so you can build the business you need for the life you crave. You can find out more at joinlifestylebuilders.com. Your life, your business, your way. Be joined. Family Entrepreneur Life. Be joined. Family Entrepreneur